Hi, good day everyone. I am Jalina Stratis. Thank you for joining GSMH Law's COVID-19 webinar series. Last week, we held a webinar on the labor implications of COVID-19. I hope you all received a copy of the materials and complied issuances. We sent them through your email addresses. So for today's webinar, it is entitled Clearing the Air, Helping Businesses Navigate COVID-19 Relief. This is a two-part webinar, and for today's part, we aim to guide businesses by providing a discussion of the various regulations and economic relief packages issued by the national government to ease the financial as well as the operational burdens of the COVID-19 pandemic. The second part of this webinar is on Thursday, April 23 at 2 o'clock p.m. For the second part, we shall focus on the more technical aspects, such as filing repertorial requirements with the BIR, SEC, and other relevant agencies. We will also discuss common tax concerns during this time of the quarantine period. So we do hope that you could join us again on Thursday. For today, our panelists are Attorney Evita Abante, Attorney Tanya Andrade, and Attorney Christian Advincola. Our moderator is Ms. Bianca Dedor. Also joining us today are two partners from our firm, Attorney Michael Mejia and Attorney Alan Tan. Attorney Mejia and Attorney Tan will provide additional inputs during the question and answer portion. Now, to formally start our webinar, let us please welcome Attorney San Diego, our partner, who will also provide us the opening remarks for this webinar. Attorney San Diego? Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's uh, 2.12 in the Philippines, 2.12 in the afternoon in the Philippines. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is the second of uh, second webinar sponsored by our firm, the Diguzman San Diego Mejia and Hernandez Law Offices. Uh, we are full, we're a full-service firm located in the heart of uh, Makati. Uh, my name is Rodolfo San Diego, one of the partners of GSMH Law. I'd also like to extend our warm welcome to our international clients and guests uh, coming from, let me see, uh, Australia, Japan, the Netherlands. I think there's also uh, someone from Brunei and uh, also from Singapore, especially our colleagues from the ASEAN Legal Alliance, uh, headed by Mr. Aloysius Wee and the Warwick Legal, Legal Network. Uh, GSMH Law is a proud member of uh, the ASEAN Legal Alliance, a network of law firms across the ASEAN uh, region, and uh, we also are affiliated with Warwick Legal Network, a global law network. Um, for first-time first registrants, this webinar series is designed to inform and educate our clients and friends regarding the various issuances by the Philippine government related to or arising from the uh, COVID-19 global pandemic. Our first webinar dealt with regulations related to labor and employment issues. Today's webinar will focus on corporation and other regulations related to commerce. Uh, there is also another, as, as Jaline mentioned earlier, there's also another webinar on Thursday at the same time, I think. Um, again, uh, as is my role in this webinar series, I would like to offer a formal disclaimer that the, regarding the contents of the, this webinar and uh, the opinions that we will express are only, for, are only informational in nature and the examples that will, be, uh, that will be given or will be mentioned are all only for illustration purposes. If you have questions specific to your establishment or to your legal uh, situation, um, we, it would be better if, if we are apprised of all the facts and circumstances applicable. Uh, so please email at gh.com or through the email addresses of the panelists today. Um, as, as we mentioned, um, the, we mentioned the source webinar will also be provided for the attendees either there through, through a link. Um, if you haven't uh, attend our first webinar and like the materials paper webinar, please drop us at council.com or any of the emails of the um, um I'd like to um, shift it back to to the webinar team headed by 
and and apitanya dade taki hello yes thank you for that attorney san diego now let's hear our house rules from our moderator miss bianca miss bianca Hello, Miss Bianca. It seems like we cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Again, I'm Bianca Tador, and I will discuss the webinar house rules. So number one, the participants other than the panelists are muted. Number two, if you wish to ask any questions, please type in your questions in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you wish not to be identified, please send the questions as an anonymous audience or attendee. Three. Questions will be posed at the end of each topic. A Q&A portion shall be held at the end of the presentation. Four, please click the raise your hand icon if you are experiencing technical issues. Five, we will provide a copy of the recording of this webinar. Again, um, it is also worth to note the topics that will be discussed today. Ms. Nostratis, may we refer the audience to the PowerPoint presentation on the table of contents or the outline of this today's webinar, please. Thank you. So our topics for today, number one, we will give a brief background on the COVID-19 pandemic or outbreak and the enhanced community quarantine that was implemented in response to this. We will also be tackling the government response, such as but not limited to the Bajau Act, its goals, purpose, and the powers provided in the implementing agencies. We will also be discussing the penalties for not complying with this act. Next. We will also be discussing the economic relief programs and packages. These includes the issuances or the programs and packages that are being implemented or proposed by these two agencies, the Department of Trade and Industry and the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. In the Department of Trade and Industries, we will be discussing the issuances on rental payments, the issuances on BPO industries, the issuances on unhampered movement of goods, and the IATF ID for covered enterprises. For BSP, moreover, we will be discussing the relief measure on custom customer identification rules and the 30-day 30 30-day 30 grace period for all loans with principal and or interest falling due within the enhanced community quarantine or ECQ without incurring any interest in the interest penalties and charges. Next, we will also be discussing the economic relief programs and packages of the Intellectual Property Office and the Bureau of Internal Revenue. In the Intellectual Property Office discussion, we will be discussing the issuances on online filing of new applications for patents, utility models, industrial designs, and trademarks claiming priority date and those not claiming priority date. We will also be discussing the effect on filing and submission of reports. For the Bureau of Internal Revenue or the BIR, we will be discussing the extension of filing and payment of taxes due the Pay Anywhere Rule, the donations for COVID-19 deductible from gross income, the loan agreements exempt from DSD or the documentary stamp taxes, and the tax amnesty on the agencies. We, will also, we also want to apprise everyone that for your questions regarding the BIR issuances, we would like to request that it be reserved or for them to be asked in the next webinar, which will be held on Thursday. Now, for our specific topics for today, we will be discussing these industries, which include manufacturing, retail establishments, transport or logistics, insurance commission, pharmaceuticals, educational institutions, recruitment agencies, and banking institutions. Ms. Nostratis, can we refer the audience or the attendees to the next slide? 
Now, after discussing the table of contents or the outline of this today's webinar, may I give the floor to the first speaker, Attorney Andrade. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So before I go into the economic packages provided, I will be discussing first um, the government's initial response to the COVID-19 outbreak. So uh, President Duterte um, implemented the enhanced community quarantine uh, starting March 17 until April 12, but was later on extended to April 30, 2020. So in response, Congress enacted the Bayanihan uh, to Heal as One Act uh, in the next slide. that allowed uh, the president and the various government departments to um, provide issuances to guide the general public as well as the business establishments or various sectors affected by the uh, enhanced community quarantine. So among the powers provided were um, here in the PowerPoint slide, you can see um, the relevant uh, powers provided to the president which we will be discussing here in our webinar. So first is to provide health workers with incentives such as the special risk allowance, as well as um, other renumatory benefits provided to health workers who contract COVID-19. And the next we have, uh, the president is authorized to take over uh, certain private, private establishments, as well as transportation companies for the efficient uh, transport of healthcare workers and essential government personnel. Next, we have um, the, gov uh, the president was provided um, the power to ensure or enact protective measures against hoarding and profiteering of commodities such as food, fuel, medicine, and medical supplies. And then to ensure that the donations would not be delayed, um, especially the medical equipment and the medical supplies that were um, at some point becoming a shortage. Uh, aside from the foregoing, the president is also authorized to ensure the availability of credit to productive sectors of the economy um, by specifically lowering interest rates or lowering the lending rates and reserve requirements. And aside from that, um, the president was also authorized to grant incentives for the manufacture or importation of equipment, the, ensure the availability of essential goods, and reg regulate and limit the operation of land, air, and sea transport, as well as move the deadline and timeline of submission of reports, filing of taxes, and payment thereof, as well as direct banks and financial institutions to provide 30-day grace periods for the payment of their loans and credit card bills. Now, in the next slide, um, these are the um, excuse me. these are the implementing agencies that will be um, assisting the president in implementing all these powers granted to him by Congress. So, in the next slide, um, I will be discussing the economic relief programs and packages provided in general. Uh, if you'll excuse me. All right, Attorney Andrade will be back in a while. She will discuss economic relief program and programs and packages. She will discuss the, the issuances of the national government, particularly is certain agencies such as DPI, DSP, IPO, and you can also ask questions throughout the presentation in the question and answer chat box provided at the bottom of your screen. You can also indicate anonymous audience if you, don't, if you do not want to be identified. Thank you. Hi, uh, I apologize for the brief uh, interruption. So for the economic relief programs and packages, um, I will be running down through each of the departments and the issuances that they provided in general that affect the business operations. So first, um, the Department of Trade and Industry uh, provided 
several issuances, first with regard to the exempted enterprises, and then as to the movement of cargoes and personnel, operation of BPOs, and thereafter to alleviate the financial impact of the, of the, of the lockdown onto retail, uh, residential and commercial establishments, the DTI as well provided concessions on rent as well as moratoriums on loans and other financial assistance programs. So first, for exempted enterprises, you can see uh, in the PowerPoint slide that there are a lot of businesses that were allowed to operate during the enhanced community quarantine. But specifically, these are establishments that provide essential goods, such as medical products, food in general, and essential hygiene products, such as soap, diapers, disinfectants. And later on, the DTI as well expanded uh, these essential goods to include pet food. Um, in the next slide, you will also see the other essential uh, establishments that are authorized to operate during the enhanced community lockdown. So, after uh, identifying the exempted enterprises, the DPI um, sought the need to issue the, the IATF later on um, implemented the IATF ID system. So this ID allows, allows the freedom of movement of goods as well as essential personnel by simply pre uh, presenting this ID. If you recall, during the start of the uh, enhanced community quarantine, there was a confusion with regard to the uh, documents to be presented when traveling um, within Metro Manila. So it was at first it was the certificate of employment with company ID and residence certificate. So to simplify this system, the DTI implemented the IATF ID system that would be presented instead of the three other documents. And later on, uh, the DOSD uh, partnered up with DevCon, a nonprofit organization um, that specializes in programming systems, to provide the rapid pass. PH program. This rapid pass PH program allows the allows for contactless inspection of ID. So instead of presenting the IATF ID where the personnel and the checkpoint um, personnel will be having contact with each other by by passing on documents, they can easily scan or verify the identity through a QR code. Uh, aside from the IATF ID. The next uh, program provided, the next uh, issuance provided by DPI is the unhampered movement of cargoes. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? So the IATF um, has consistently um, reiterated that the movement of goods, whether food or non food, must be unhampered. So to assist in this, the DTI as well. Issued this, uh, issued this regular uh, this circular, as well, including the implementation of the IATF, IATF ID. So remember that the IATF ID um, is a substitute for the identity verification of the personnel, but the cargo um, inspection to be conducted must always uh, must include a cargo manifest or a delivery receipt. Please note as well that the number of personnel that may be allowed to operate cargo vehicles and delivery services is limited to three personnel. Uh, aside from the movement of cargo, the DTI has also issued a memorandum circular or advisory on the operation, operation of BPOs and export-oriented industries. So these industries are allowed to operate during the enhanced community quarantine subject to on-site or near-site accommodation arrangements. Um, if you recall, during the start of the enhanced community quarantine, the BPO companies were required um, to 
to fit to arrange work from home arrangements to, or to allow their to provide accommodation arrangements for their employees who will, who will still be working or needed a skeletal workforce. Other activities that are allowed also during the extended enhanced community quarantine are the delivery and installation of these equipment to set up to assist in their setup for work from home arrangement, as well as the delivery and installation of, of telecom telecommunication services and other necessary support services that they may need during their operations. So in this issuance also, they provide the personnel that who are allowed to travel subject to the presentation of these IDs, uh, these documents, the company ID, the certificate of employment, the certificate of registration of the export enterprise, and the support service staff as well. After identifying the essential, uh, the establishments allowed to operate, DTI issued a issued um, a new advisory on the concession of rents due to this lockdown. First, uh, DTI issued a waiver of rent for establishments um, for established uh, establishments operating in malls as well as entertainment establishments. Um, during the first issuance of the IATF, the the malls were malls were ordered temporarily closed, while business establishments offering leisure and entertainment, such as nightclubs, bars, and taverns, were likewise ordered closed. So in this issuance, the DTI as well stated that the lessor and the lessee shall share the responsibility by waiving the rental fees and charges of the store during the said closure. Considering that the closure is extended, um, this order still continues until the lifting of the enhanced community quarantine. Aside from the waiver of rent on mall tenants, the DTI as well has provided a concession on rent for residential units and commercial rent. So for, uh, in this uh, advisory, the, the tenants are given a 30 day grace period for the payment of their rent without incurring any interest penalties and fees. For, please note as well that if the rents falling due during the enhanced community quarantine are more than one month, then they may, the, the tenant may uh, exercise his right to amortize the rental payment in six equal months after the lifting of the enhanced community quarantine. So what are the, um, who are covered by the concessions on rent? For residential rent, automatic, all residential units, whether condominiums or houses for rent. For commercial rent, um, the DTI put particular focus on MSMEs or the micro, small, and medium enterprises. Uh, in the said issuance, as you can see here in the PowerPoint screen, they provided a table on how to classify the types of MSMEs. So micro businesses are those who have assets not more than 3 million, while small businesses are those with 3 million, but not, not more than 5, 15 million, while medium enterprises are those with more than 15 million, but less than 100 million. This is a sample computation of the rent. For example, you have unpaid rent for the two months, which totals 30,000 30, pesos. So this 30,000 pesos may be amortized um, into the next six months. For example, if the enhanced community quarantine is lifted on May, then this, uh, the installment payment shall start from May onwards. So after providing uh, concessions on rent, the DTI as well is ready to assist MSMEs by providing their pondo para sa pagbabago at pag program and the Small Business Corporation Loan Moratorium. The P3 program is um, 
the P3 program is a lending or financing program uh, provided by Small Business Corporation. Uh, Small Business Corporation is the financing arm of DTI for MSMEs. So in this, um, in this uh, particular issuance, the DTI allotted 1 billion pesos to target micro and small enterprises by providing the loan, the following loan amounts as shown in the slides with an interest rate of 0.5% per month. Aside from that, all enterprises, all small and medium, enter small and medium enterprises with ongoing loans with small business corporation are likewise provided one month moratorium on loan payments from March 16 to April 14, 2020. Next, we go to the issuances of Banco Central ng Pilipinas. The BSP has issued Memorandum Number 2020-15, which provides for relief measure on customer identification rules. For those, um, for those familiar of the Know Your Customer rule um, for banking establishments, it provides that um, clients must be able to provide um, valid identification IDs when they wish to transact with banking institutions. However, uh, in this memorandum circular, um, BSP has lifted or provided leniency to individuals who wish to, um, who do not have access to bank accounts, but wish to open bank accounts, such as for the availment of the social amelioration program or the camp program. The next, um, the next issuance of BSP um, implements the Bayanihan to Heal As One Act, where the where the bank banking institutions are ordered to provide a 30-day grace period for loan payments as well as credit card payments. Uh, this is a direct quote from the Bayanihan to Heal As One Act. So it is not merely limited to banks, but also includes quasi-banks, financing companies, and lending companies, whether public or private. This shall include as well the government service insurance system, social security system, and the PAG-EBIG fund. So all loans for those covered institutions um, shall implement a 30-day grace period. Um, the sample illustration will be later um, further discussed by Attorney Abante. For the next uh, government agency, um, the, for those having uh, intellectual property um, transactions, such as um, applications for copyrights or trademarks and patents, um, the intellectual property as early as March 14 has already issued guidelines on the service of, um, on the provision of their services in, in light of the enhanced community quarantine. So since their office has suspended um, operations, they have provided for a, a schedule of the suspended and rescheduled um, applications, but has also provided an internet or online channel where you may file applications for patents, utility models, industrial design, and trademark applications. The next agency uh, and next I'll be discussing the Bureau of Internal Revenue issuances. So the first issuance that was released by BIR was the extension of filing and payment of taxes due. Considering the enhanced community quarantine, the annual payment which was scheduled on April 15 um, has been moved due to the enhanced community quarantine. As such, while the, while the Bureau of Internal Revenue um, encourages taxpayers um, provided an extension to the payment of taxes, they have also advised banks to allow taxpayers to pay who wish to pay during the enhanced community quarantine. So 
for the extension of filing and payment, um, we have provided the table of all the tax forms and the, the period for filing, the original period for filing and the extended due date. This will be extensively discussed in day two of our uh, webinar. The next issue once I'm going to cover is the pay anywhere rule. So under the pay anywhere rule, the Bureau of Internal Revenue um, provides that if taxpayers wish to pay their taxes on time, they may still do so by filing at any authorized agent bank nearest your location. So um, in, in usual practice, in normal circumstances, what we, a taxpayer would usually pay in the revenue district office where he is registered. So for example, in this case, I live in Makati, but I'm registered in Pasig and pay my taxes in Pasig. So in this case, BIR has authorized um, all agent banks, whether in different um, districts, to accept payments. So I may pay my taxes here in an authorized, authorized agent bank here in Makati. The next issuance provided by BIR is the deduction of donations for COVID-19 relief operations. So this covers cash donations, donations of all critical or needed healthcare equipment, relief goods, and use of equipment such as shuttle service or buildings for um, COVID-19 healthcare facilities. Aside from donations, We also have loan agreements, which are exempt from documentary stamp tax. So the BIR issued this to clarify that all payment of loans and all payment of loans shall be given a 30-day grace period. So any uh, amendments to it would be exempt from DST or documentary stamp tax. Lastly, uh, the Bureau of Internal Revenue has also issued an extension of the tax amnesty on delinquencies. Originally, the period was supposed to end on April 2020, but was extended to June 8, 2020. So these are all the, these are uh, among the general and notable um, government issuances um, in response to COVID-19. But um, in our next, in the next segment of our webinar, we will be talking about the industry-specific relief and guidelines. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. Before we proceed to the uh, to the next topics in this webinar, let us first entertain the questions from our clients and our attendees. This is a question from Ching Chua. Hi, do we extend the 30-day payment grace period only to customers who raise this request or should this be extended to all our customers with payment due date falling within ABCQ? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, there was a part that was choppy. Sorry. So this is a question from Ms. Ching Chua. Hi, do we extend the 30-day payment grace period only to customers who raise this request 
or should this be extended to all our customers with payment due date falling within the ECQ? Okay, um, so the 30 day grace period must be provided to all customers because aside from providing aside from providing the 30 day grace period, the DTI issuance also covers penalties for those individuals or corporations who do not provide the 30 day grace period. So we have another question from an anonymous attendee. Is there a penalty for lessors who will not allow the amortiz amortization of rent? Uh, like uh, my previous answer, um, the DTI issuance also covers penalties for those individuals or corporations who do not allow the exercise of the said amortization. And actually, uh, the anonymous attendee has actually a follow-up question. What are the remedies of the lessees in this case? Should the lessors uh, will not allow the amortization of rent? Uh, in such a key, uh, for lessors? The lessees. For the lessees. Hello, uh, Nikki, well, let's just clarify, you know. Uh, asking about amortization of the rent due uh, my understanding is that uh, only the deferment of the rent is allowed is mandatory but uh, can you clarify if there is a provision requiring the lessor to allow the lessee to amortize that one month period or that two month period that was covered by the deferment of the rent okay so um, in the in the issue, DTI issuance, uh, it provides that the cumulative rents shall be amortized. So by the by the use of the word shall, it means that it it will be mandatory for lessors to provide the said amortization. Okay. The the follow up question, I guess, is. What will their what will their remedies be in case the lessor does not uh, agree to amortize? Uh, the remedy for lessees would be to file a file a written um, a written complaint with the DTI, since they will be the handling agency that will uh, investigate and verify such complaints. Thank you, Attorney Mejia. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. We have another question from an anonymous attendee. Regarding the concession and rentals, for clarification, does it mean that the only qualified for this are MSMBs only? Uh, no, the concession on rent um, also covers um, residential units. Now, for, for, commercial, um, for commercial rents, you have to look at the table provided by provided by DTI. Now, micro, small, and medium enterprises are those based on their assets. So if your assets are below 100, 100 million, then you will qualify for the grace period on rents. Okay. We have a question from... Just, just to add to that, no? just so it's a quick, uh, as a quick guide. So residential rents are covered by the grace period. Uh, commercial rents, it has to be an MSME, um, and they have to be non-operating during the period of the ECQ. So even if uh, the lessee uh, in a commercial lease uh, is, an, an, uh, is a MSME, but if it operates, then it will not be entitled to the grace period. Thank you, Attorney Mejia. We have another question from an anonymous attendee. What is the status of the rapid pass system? Is it now being implemented? Uh, last I checked, the rapid pass um, website was actually down for maintenance. So the, considering that this is a nonprofit move um, with the, um, in partnership with BOST, um, the system has which was rolled out originally April 6, is not yet fully operational, but is already being used. So this can be used in conjunction with the IATF ID. 
we have uh, one last question for this uh, part of this webinar from an anonymous attendee again. Uh, we are having difficulty in operating companies when public transport is not allowed. We all know that majority of workers use public transport. How can this be resolved? Well, this, um, this issue is actually one of the topics being tackled by the IATF come the, pos uh, come the lifting of the, uh, of the enhanced community quarantine. But currently, um, the government has not yet provided any uh, response to the public transport needed by essential personnel, but has instead required, um, uh, no, not required, encouraged um, private establishments to provide accommodations, uh, accommodation arrangements to their employees. Okay, thank you, Attorney Andrade. Now we will proceed to the next topic. The next topic or the next discussion will be spearheaded by Attorney Advincola. I think the next topic, I apologize for the mistake, the next topic will actually be discussed by Attorney Andrade again. Attorney Andrade? Yes. For this next part of the webinar, we will be discussing um, the in, um, industry-specific relief and guidelines to guide um, the businesses that may be covered under this. So first, um, we tackle the manufacturing industry. Um, in the right, right side of the slide, you can see the various um, memorandum circulars that were issued um, in response to the impact and operations of, on, on the manufacturing industry. Now, for the next slide, um, these are the BTI guidelines. Um, pertinent to food and drugs manufacturing. Now, as I've earlier discussed, um, BPI has con also consistently um, pushed that good, the movement of goods, whether food or non-food, must be unhampered. So, um, government aid, uh, the implementing of agencies must likewise um, allow these uh, essential personnel and delivery of essential goods. So here, um, we have a joint admin order 20-01, which, which provides that expedited release of refrigerated containers, specifically those carrying essential goods, uh, frozen foods, or medical um, equipment on supplies. We have next joint uh, admin uh, joint circular number twenty two, which also provides that um, there will be that certain products uh, certain certain goods must be allowed um, essential movement as well as the movement of essential personnel. This this um, memorandum circular was actually issued to uh, emphasize the powers granted to the president in the Bayanihan Hill as one act. So the, the DTI issued circular 20-08, providing for all the covered establishments. Um, earlier, I discussed this already and provided actually the list, this list um, and discussed it in the first part of the webinar. So just a restatement, it contains the unhampered movement of all cargos in the entire Luzon area, as well as the provision for shuttle services and the operation of skeletal workforce. Now, uh, with regard to the operation of manufacturing companies, um, this uh, memorandum circular provides that they, um, companies must oper operate at a 50% uh, skeletal workforce. 
So this workforce, however, may be increased subject to the, um, the supply levels of the manufacturing company as well as the provisional or author, uh, authorization of DTI to increase the skeletal workforce. And in conjunction as well, um, the DTI promoted the rapid pass application, which is also being used now to promote contactless uh, inspection of um, relevant IDs need, needed for the transport of goods. So this is a quick um, this is a quick uh, guideline on how the rapid pass works. So once you once you apply for a digital pass you will be provi provided by a QR code similar to those provided in the GCash application where the, where the checkpoint, where the person scanning the checkpoint will also have a scanner that will scan your provided unique QR code. And after verifying your informa the information in the QR code, then you will be allowed uh, passage. So aside from the general goods um, moving in and out of the Luzon area, the Food and Drug Administration has also provided for guidelines with regard to certain um, drugs and medical equipment being, um, being transported to in aid of the COVID-19 relief. So for those, um, for those wishing to trade import, trade or import um, medical supplies. The FDA has provided a online platform where you may apply for a license to operate. In this slide, uh, we provide the general procedure that, that a user must go through um, when applying for an online, uh, online application for a license to operate. So in this, um, in this manner of application, everything is done online. So the rules are relaxed as to the authenticity, uh, the authenticity or the submission of um, hard copies of the documents. These will all be transmitted after the lifting of the enhanced community quarantine. For renewal applications as well, the Food and Drug Administration has also provided the online um, application for renewal and will not penalize uh, the expired um, permits. For export enterprises who are registered under PESA, um, since um, the enterprises are allowed to operate, PESA has issued several guidelines regarding the sanitation and adoption of safety measures um, due to um, in line with the DOH's protocols for COVID-19 um, safety measures as well as social distancing measures. So all EcoZone uh, developers or operators and, lock, and those locators are also allowed or authorized to submit, their, submit the renewal of their applications um, online. <clears throat> For retail establishments, this is a restatement of DTI's um, issuances on the anti-hoarding or anti-panic buying the price freeze and extended operating hours. So for anti-hoarding or anti-panic buying, the DTI has limited the number of goods that may be purchased, the quantity for each item that is provided here in this list. And the retailers are likewise directed to post notices in the respective supermarkets or stores to provide the, to guide the general public of the number of items that may be bought. Now, aside from the said limit, they also provide for penalties 
for establishments that violate or do not follow the anti-hoarding or anti-panic anti buying or, uh, circular. These range from a fine of 5,000 to 2 million and an, an imprisonment of not less than five, but not more than 15 years. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. We actually don't have questions regarding the manufacturing and retail industries. Because of this, we will now proceed to the next topics, one of which is the pharmaceutical industry. This, among others, will be discussed by Attorney Christian Advincula. Again, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to type them in in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen. Attorney Advincula, I will now give the floor to you. Thank you, Bianca. Now let's proceed to pharmaceutical companies. I will emphasize that pharmaceutical companies are covered enterprises. Therefore, the unhampered movement of cargo and the unhampered movement of personnel apply. First is the unhampered movement of cargo. I will restate that the movement of all types of cargoes of pharmaceutical companies within Luzon, the entire, the entire Luzon, to and from the entire Luzon shall be unhampered. So what are the products or the cargoes that should be unhampered? Medicines and vitamins, medical products such as PPEs, masks, gloves, among others. If the delivery truck or your vehicle is being subjected to random inspection, the delivery personnel or your company personnel shall present cargo manifest or delivery receipt indicating, number one, the destination, the nature, number two, and number three, the quantity of the loaded goods and cargoes. Now let's proceed to the unhampered movement of personnel. Under the DTI Memorandum Circular 20-08, which was issued on March 20, 2020, all staff or employees working in servicing a manufacturing or processing enterprises establishments of medicines, vitamins, and other medical products and equipment shall be permitted to pass through the control points. So what should they present? So the, this personnel shall be allowed to enter and exit control points upon presentation of any of the following. Valid company ID, proof of residence, certification of employment, and your official IATF ID issued by the Department of Trade and Industry. Now, Customs Administrative Order 07-2020 provides the following tax and duty exempt covered importations. So what are these covered importations? So number one, personal protect protective equipment or the PPE the lab equipment and dairy agents, medical equipment and devices, support and maintenance for lab and medical equipment, the surgical equipment and supplies, other medical supplies, and consumables such as alcohol, sanitizers, tissue, hand soap, detergent, and common medicines such as paracetamol, tablets, and suspension, mephenamic acid, vitamin, tablets, and suspension. COVID-19 testing kits are also duty-exempt importation and other medical supplies and equipment as may be identified by the Department of Health. Now, how may, who may avail the tax and duty exemption? So, manufacturers included in the master list of the Department of Trade and Industry and other incentive granting bodies of the national government to import covered goods are the ones who may avail the tax and duty exemption. If I am included, if my company is included in the master list of the DTI, how can I avail of the tax and duty exemption? Number one, the eligible manufacturer should secure a tax exemption endorsement or TEI from the Department of Finance Revenue Office after April 12, 2020. 
or upon lifting of the declaration of ECQ, whichever comes earlier. Number two, you should present the TEI to the customs officer concerned. However, if the TEI has not yet been secured by your company, the declarant of the imported goods shall file a PGD or a provisional goods declaration under the PGD system of the Bureau of Customs. So for the customs clearance procedure, if the imported goods comprise of medical equipment, medical supplies for commercial purposes, the documents to present by the declarant are the license to operate and proof of application for product notification with the FDA. If the imported goods, however, are ventilators, ventilators and their respective accessories for commercial purposes, a license to operate is the only document required. Please note, however, that the importers of the above goods are exempt from presentation of their product notification or the Certificate of Product Notification, CPN, or Certificate of Product Registration, CPR, prior to release. So what are the other exemptions for pharmaceutical companies? Aside from duty exempt or the duty tax exempt goods, there are various tax exemptions under Revenue Regulation number 6-2020. What are these tax exemptions? First is value-added tax, excise taxes, and other fees. So if you are importing healthcare equipment, if you are importing supplies, test kits, and medicines, and the materials needed to make them, or the raw materials, you are likewise exempt from VAT, excise taxes, and other fees. The revenue regulation also provides that the importation of these goods shall not be subject to the issuance of APRIG or the authority to release imported goods. Now, for the insurance for the insurance companies, the Insurance Commission issued several regulations, circular letters involving exemptions from movement restrictions, as well as remote selling of insurance products. Under circular letter number 2020-40, health insurance and HMO providers must secure ECQ exemption certification for their employees by submitting a certified list of personnel to the IC. So what is this ECQ exemption certification? This is to establish a skeletal workforce. So the insurer concerned must submit a list, a certified list of personnel to the insurance commission to obtain an ECQ certificate of exemption. Now, entities or the insurers must adopt skeletal workforce limited to essential personnel only. So what are the, who are these essential personnel? This includes those personnel whose functions are necessary to enable full delivery of claims settlement processes. Personnel, however, who are 54 years old, pregnant, women, those with pregnant women, those with underlying conditions with COVID-19 symptoms, or those who have been exposed to persons under investigations or PUI or PUM cannot be considered part of your workforce. Now, entities are required to make the necessary arrangements. So if you are the insurer, you are required to make the necessary arrangement for the transportation of your personnel from their residences to your office and vice versa, as well as provisions for their food or their meals, their lodging accommodation, including 
their laundry facilities and supplies. Circular letter number 2020-29 provides for the guidelines on the initiatives of life insurance companies to sell life insurance product to the public during the ECQ. So what are the two requirements to launch a sales initiative during the ECQ? So first, if you want to launch a sales initiative, you must write a letter signed by your company's president or your company's duly authorized representatives advising the commission, the insurance commission, of the proposed initiative. That is the letters. The second requirement is the mechanics. So the mechanics of the initiative, the areas where the company will operate, as well as the names of products. So what are these insurance products covered by your initiative? I will reiterate, there must be a letter signed by your company president or your company, company's duly authorized representative as well as a mechanics, which contains the details of your sales initiative. Second, you must obtain minimum customer identification and information documents. This is, this is required in your customer due diligence or CDD. Now for life insurance companies, the insurance commission may recall your initiative if at any time after the insurance commission's review, you committed a violation or violations, non-compliance with the provision of law, circular letters issued by the insurance commission, or existing rules and regulations without prejudice to the authority of the commission to impose applicable penalties and or other administrative sanctions. Now, we proceed to educational institutions. Now, the Department of Education issued guidelines because, because of the COVID-19 pandemic for uncompleted school year, DepEd states that education institutions must adjust its academic calendar to cover the ECQ period. The schools, the educational institutions are highly encouraged to adopt alternative learning systems through the use of computers with internet access. And all schools also must adopt a system of reporting COVID-19 cases in line with DOH directives. The Commission on Higher Education, or CHED, issued an advisory number 06, it provides that private higher education institutions or HEIs are allowed to make adjustments for their academic calendar. So the CHED must be given notice of such changes. And for those HEIs who are authorized, are authorized to extend academic calendar by one month. They're advised to adopt measures to safeguard health of faculty students, and staff. HEIs shall continue to direct all its employees to work from home, except if a skeletal workforce is required for processing of, for processing of services, for processing of salary disinfection, and security services. I would like to add that for for higher education institutions, according to COVID-19 advisory number 06 of the Department of the Commission, of, Commission on Higher Education, if the HEI has an old June academic calendar, they are allowed to finish their current semester, trimester, quarter, or equivalent period by April 30. However, graduation ceremonies are still discouraged in accordance with social distancing measures. On the other hand, colleges and universities that adopted the August school calendar are authorized to extend their semester up to a month, one month 
after the lifting of the said quarantine. Now let's move on to the transport and logistics sector. For Marina, the Maritime Industry Authority, applications for renewal of certificate of ownership and licenses shall be made electronically or at the nearest Marina Regional Office. Again, applications for renewal of the certificate of ownership and licenses shall be made electronically or at the nearest Marina Regional Office. Shipping operations monitoring form, however, are real-time monitoring of shipping operations. Now, Marina extends the validity of the statutory certificates issued by the agency and its recognized organizations for Philippine registered ships until May 31, 2020. This Philippine registered ships are engaged or should be engaged in international trade. So the, the statutory certificates or your licenses to operate issued by the Maritime Industry Authority is extended until May 31, 2020. Now for the Philippine Ports Authority, the validity of permits that expired before March 17, 2020, so this refers to Philippine Ports Authority permits or PPA permits that expired before March 17, 2020 and will expire or will expire during the ECQ period is extended. So if they expired before March 7, 2020 or will expire during the ECQ period, the new deadline for this is June 30, 2020 or until lifting of the ECQ, whichever comes earlier or later, whichever comes later. So all applications for accreditation submitted before March, March 14, 2020 are deemed approved for purposes of doing business until June 30, 2020. So applications may be made electronically. And lastly, for the and for LTO, Land Transportation Office, they issued this they issued a memorandum or a circular which provides that no penalties for late registration of motor vehicles shall be imposed and which shall expire during the ACQ period. So if your motor vehicle or, the, or your registration of your motor vehicles permits will expire or license will expire during the ACQ period, then according to the LTO, they will not impose penalties. Thank you, Attorney Edwin Kula, for discussing the topics. Now, we have two questions from two anonymous attendees. Number one, if I will sell medical equipment, do I need to get certification for them? Which agencies? Sorry, Bianca. Again, Bianca. If I will sell medical equipment, do I need to get certification for them? Which agencies? Um, if you will sell medical equipment, it is assumed that you have a license to operate because according, according to a DOH circular, all manufacturers must have license to operate, specifically manufacturers of ventilators, respirators, Ventilators, respirators, manufacturers, as well as PPEs must have LTO. So it is assumed that before you sell them, you must have a license to operate. And also, you must have a product notification. If you have those requirements, then you can sell your medical equipment. Um, if I may add to that, uh, if the medical equipment is PPE and it's, on, and it's only produced during the ECQ, then the requirement to register, then there is no requirement to register. However, if you will continue to manufacture or to sell even after the ECQ, you need to apply with the FDA within three months from the lifting of the ECQ. 
Thank you, Attorney Mejia. We will now proceed in on the second question. This is from a client engaged in IP biotechnology, but he named himself as an anonymous attendee. He wants to sell rapid test kits. Can he sell the test kits even if not certified or approved by DOH? Um, all test kits must be approved by the DOH. Actually, the FDA requires um, that all test kits must be must underwent or must undergo screening from the FDA as well as the DOH. So we cannot sell um, test kits in the Philippines without any accreditation or clearance from the FDA because even the local test kits, they are, they are required to meet specific standards or specific specific standards before they can be made uh, available to the, to the public here in the Philippines. Thank you, Attorney Aguincola. It appears that we only have two questions for the topics that you discuss. Again, we encourage everyone to ask questions so we, we can answer them. And if you have questions, please do not hesitate to type them in in the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen. Now, we will now proceed to the next topics that will be discussed by Attorney Abante, Attorney Evita Abante. I will give the floor now to Attorney Abante. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, first of all, um, I would like to thank you for joining us in our webinar today. And further, uh, on behalf of USMA Flow, we hope that you and the people vital in your lives are healthy and safe. So my discussion for this afternoon, I hope you could still spare me um, 10 minutes of your time in this God, in this unholy hour. So thank you very much for my colleagues, Nikki and Christian for, uh, for the very insightful discussion on different industries in the Philippines implementing the um, COVID-19 um, and the IATF regulations, okay? So right now, my discussion will be on limited to recruitment and banking institution as discussed earlier by my colleague, Nikki. So first, proceed with recruitment. So for the recruitment, um, the PUEA um, basically issued several issuances to implement the um, IATF regulations. So basically these are suspensions or extensions on filings and submissions. The reason for the issuances of this um, of the COVID-19 related issuances basically is to ensure compliance with social distancing measures. So in order for us to remember which ones are suspended and which ones are extended, um, one, the basic uh, idea we have to remember will be first, it, does it require a person-to-person -person interaction or does it require personal appearance? Because if it does, it is actually suspended until further notice. If it doesn't, there will be an extension for 30 days or 60 days, as will be discussed later. So we will, so I will get back to you on that, and we will discuss which ones are suspended and which ones are um, extended. Okay, so let's proceed with the first POEA Memorandum Circular Number 7. So as I mentioned earlier, um, can we proceed with the, Jack, can we proceed with the um, next two slides? Thank you very much, Jack. Okay, so what are those which are suspended? Those suspended until further notice are the applications for principal accreditation and all mine well contract processing with land center and sea base center, and the request for overseas employment certificates for Balik Mangagawa or the um, overseas contract workers. So, as I mentioned earlier, why, why are they suspended until further notice? Because these new applications are, must be done personally. For example, um, the principal accreditation documents must be submitted to the land center and sea base center, so they are suspended until further notice. For the um, re request for the overseas employment certificates, 
these are done over the counter. Hence, they are suspended until further notice to in compliance with the social distancing measures of the IATF. Okay. Under this circular also, the POEA also required that contract processing for land-based and sea-based workers may only be done to the POEA online processing system um, land-based or sea-based until feasible skeleton workforce will be in place. Why? Because um, if there is a feasible skeleton workforce, there's a lack of transportation, public transportation for the skeleton workforce. That's why they are suspended. Okay. Now, let's proceed with which ones are, which ones are those which require the extension. Okay. Under the same circular, the POEA um, allowed the extension for the application for renewal, upgrading, and extension of license and branch authority during the ECQ period, whose license expiration fall between March 15 until April 14, 2020. But if this application's renewal, upgrading, and extension license and branch authorities were already received, but pending evaluation, review, and approval, they will be acted upon on the next working day, the following lifting, uh, following the lifting of the total lockdown in ECQ. So in our in our case right now, the ECQ will be lifted on April 30. However, um, May 1, it is a Thursday if I'm not mistaken. Since May 1 is a legal holiday, being a labor day here in the Philippines, the next working day will be on May 4. So that's the only time or that's the first day where the, the agency will act upon the applications which are already submitted for their review. Okay. Now, there is also a legal, the legal assistance and conciliation, mediation, and adjudication services are likewise suspended until the lifting of, and suspended until further notice, subject to the issuance of appropriate guidelines for teleconferencing and other remote means. Again, if you will notice, the legal assistance, conciliation, and mediation adjudication services are suspended until further notice. Why? Because this inherently requires a person-to-person -person interaction. So I think you can follow what, um, how the issuances were issued by the POEA. So it will be easy, easier for us to remember which ones are suspended and which ones are extended. Okay. So now let's proceed with the other issuance on the POEA Memorandum Circular on the extensions. The POEA granted 30-day extensions for renewal, upgrading, and extension of principal accreditation of land-based and recruitment agencies and of sea-based manning agencies um, 30 days from the expiration provided the period, the expiration is falling between the periods of March 15 to April 14, 2020. Okay, so now let's, so that's for the, recruit, for the recruitment agencies. Now we will proceed with seafarers. Under the same memorandum circular, the the POEA granted extension for 60 days of the seafarer's contract. First, it is provided that the seafarer contract must be consummated and the seafarer is prevented by circumstances to disembark or to be repatriated. So, what are the other conditions in order for the seafarer contract to be extended for 60 days? First, the seafarer must be asymptomatic of COVID-19. Second, the extension must be in mutual agreement with the principal. Third, in compliance with the, it is be, it, the extension must be in compliance with the requirement for exemption set by international seafaring authorities. And further, if the licensed sea-based manning agencies with seafarers whose employment contracts are extended, uh, they must be duly reported to the POEA. Further, aside from these conditions, the seafarer's passport and seafarer's book must also be valid during this period in order for them to, to be granted a 60-day extension. Okay. 
Okay, so so that's how the extension would be granted. Now, what will be the duties or the obligations of the Philippine Recruitment Agency as well as the license manning agency? First, they should closely monitor and report the status and condition of the deployed Filipino worker. Also, they should provide assistance to newly hired OFWs and joining crew whose flights scheduled were canceled, whose crew change was deferred, those who are stranded in Metro Manila due to the ECQ, and the assistance, of course, should not be limited to temporary accommodation, food, and transportation back to their provinces in coordination with OWA. And its incident must be reported to the Welfare and Employment Office via email. We will send you the attached the format um, provided by the POEA under its memorandum circular. Okay. Now, so if you could, if you notice the POEA memorandum circular is um, it has a system. Before we we provided you with um, how the contract will be extended and what are the obligations of the Philippine Recruitment Agencies. Now, for the POEA Memorandum Circular number nine, we'll provide you on the guidelines on the arrival and repatriation of the OSW. So for arrival, um, first, one of the guidelines provided by the POEA is that if the person is asymptomatic, regardless of nationality, race, and age, but with travel history to China and its end or exposure history to a confirmed COVID-19 case, this is interesting, he is required to undergo monitored home quarantine. Again, so what are the keywords here? Asymptomatic, travel history to China, you are already required. To undergo monitored home quarantine. Thereafter, as mentioned in our slide, if the person, regardless of nationality, race, and age, but has fever or lower respiratory illness symptoms and travel history to countries with confirmed COVID 19 case, he is only advised to undergo monitored home quarantine. So, um, so that's a very interesting um, issue once by the POEA on um, which ones are required, who are the ones required to undergo home quarantine and who are only advised to undergo home quarantine. So the home quarantine period is in line with the issue once of the DOH on how long the home quarantine period will be. Will be. So it will be for not less than 14 days subject to the extension by the monitoring public health facilities or public health authorities. Okay, now, so those are for the recruitment agencies. The next slide will be on uh, issue ones by the Department of Labor and Employment on what can be an additional source of income for displaced employees during the ec 2 So the Department Order number 210, is actually called Tulong Tanghanap Buhay sa ating Displaced Disadvantaged Workers Program, in short, TUPAD. And this is very important. It also includes hashtag Barangay Ko, Bahay Ko, Disinfecting Sanitation Project for our um, international participants. So Barangay Ko, Bahay Ko is roughly interpreted as my village, my house, disinfect and sanitation project. So the DOLE issued this memorandum because it aims to contribute to poverty reduction, particularly this ECQ period. So this is a community-based package um, of assistance that provides temporary wage employment for the state workers, underemployed, and self-employed. So how long will this um, TUPAD hashtag BKBK um, disinfecting sanitation project um, last? It will last for 10 days. So what will be the work? As the title suggests, hashtag BKBK disinfection um, and sanitation project. It will involve the disinfection and sanitation of houses and dwellings 
and immediate vicinity. So what are the package assistance? What will it do? The package assistance will include payment of wages, which is equivalent to 100% of the prevailing highest minimum wage in the region, an enrollment to group micro insurance. And okay, this is very interesting. I'm not sure if those who will join this will want to, um, to avail of this program. They will need to conduct basic orientation on safety and health through dissemination or brochures. So it, what will be the mode of implementation? It will be through the direct um, administration or accredited co-partners. So considering that they will be um, they will be doing the sanitation project, what are who, those who are eligible, what are their entitlements? Okay, so one will be the certificate of eligibility to project care and transportation assistance tempor and temporary shelter. So as mentioned, those, are, those who are eligible are those distressed land-based and sea-based OFWs who are bound uh, for the residences outside of NPR. Okay. okay, so now let's proceed with banking institutions. As my colleague Nikki already introduced you earlier, the first memorandum covered is the relief measure on customer identification rules. As Nikki mentioned earlier, it is called the Know Your Customer Rule or for short KYC. So what is the Know Your Customer Rule? Why is it, why is it created? Nikki already um, informed you a snippet of what is this all about. So I'll just discuss with you um, the reason behind the issue one. So first, this is to facilitate the delivery and of welfare funds to identify beneficiaries who have no available IDs or transaction accounts with any financial institution. So the central bank decided to relax this requirement since they consider the accounts are at low risk. Nonetheless, the central bank introduced control measures to guard against money laundering and terrorism financing risk. So, so any requirement for the presentation of valid identification card shall be relaxed. As I mentioned, only relaxed. Now, including for electronic or online customer onboarding and transactions subject to the following conditions. Why is it relaxed? I will let you know later. So, First, the, the amount of transactions um, must not exceed. I think you should not, this should be must not exceed. I'm sorry, we will just correct this later. Must not exceed 50,000 per day per account. Um, the customer is either a permanent or temporary resident or who conducts business in the area which has been declared to be under ECQ by the competent authority. The customer shall be shall submit certification either in hard copy or electronic form, which need not be notarized that he or she has no valid ID. And this is why the identification card shall be relaxed. The customer's account activity shall be subject to ongoing monitoring by the BSFI to identify potential abuse of the relaxed requirement in any suspicious transactions shall be reported to the Anti-Money Laundering Council within the prescribed period. Further, the financial institutions are expected to obtain the required minimum information from the customer and perform risk-based customer due diligence. The BSP's initiative is actually to ensure that Filipinos have continuous access to basic government and financial services. Okay. So let's now proceed with the implementing, implementing rules and regulations of the Bayanihan to Heal as One app. So my colleague Nikki earlier showed you this slide, uh, the, the, which is taken literally from the Republic Act 11469. Um, okay, so now, let's now proceed. What are the covered institutions? Covered institutions refers to all lenders, whether public or private, including the following, as herein mentioned. So banks, quasi-banks, financial institutions, 
the GSIS, the SSS, the Pag-ibig or the uh, Home Development Report Fund. So in order to spare us of uh, literally just going through the provisions, so it provided you with examples. Because the, as mentioned by Nikki earlier, this um, IRR has given um, um, the bank, the covered institutions are required to implement a minimum of 30 day grace period for the payment of all loans. Okay. So, first illustration if a loan has a maturity date of March 17, 2020, a covered institution must allow the borrower to pay the loan until April 16 without incurring interest. Um, penalties, fees, and other charges. So basically, they just extended the the period on um, payment. Um, further, covered institutions are prohibited from applying charges or interest, as I mentioned earlier, during the 30 days grace period to future payments, amortization of individual, household, micro, small, and medium enterprises and corporate borrowers. In case a borrower has multiple loans, the grace period shall be applied to each loan. Okay, now, so, does the implementing rules and regulation apply to all loans accounts that are um, current or past due under the, the law? Yes, the IRR covers all accounts regardless of whether these accounts are current or past due. So second, are fees charges to loans extended or credit lines granted? For example, credit card, renewal fees scheduled to be paid during the ECQ period covered by the, RIR, the IRR. Yes, fees and charges related to loans extended or credit lines granted are covered. So I have a credit card. As a matter of fact, Metro Bank, uh, my bank, has been sending me messages every month. For example, the first ECQ period was on March 15. Uh, when it was declared, um, they already informed me that um, they will be, I am entitled to the 30 days um, grace period. Okay, so, um, so, so, so if you would, but I'm, but there are other, um, um, there are other, I think, credit institutes or banks which do not send text messages. But under this law, um, they're required to implement the 30 day grace period. Okay. Now, so are loan accounts covered by post-dated checks, auto debit, or auto deduct arrangements with lending financial institutions covered by the IAR? Yes. So for post-dated checks, I will give you an example. For example, uh, my friend bought a rent-to-own condo in Ortigas. So he issued post-dated checks. Uh, in payment uh, for the monthly amortization of the office fund unit. So that's one. For the auto debit, I have a personal experience of auto debit on my account for for a motor vehicle. So it is actually common. In this case, the financial institutions are advised to coordinate with their clients if they wish to proceed with the arrangement despite the mandatory 30-day grace period granted by law. This is a, um, a funny incident, I just have to tell you. One time I was in a bank here in Lipa. Well, for anyone, for all of you, I forgot to mention, I'm live here in Lipa City, Batangas. So I went to my bank and a person before me um, was making a deposit for an auto debit for her auto loan. There were two tellers, um, there were two tellers and they were asking, um, are the um, are my payments um, suspended or is the auto debit suspended? Unfortunately, the two tellers um, said different answer different uh, answer differently. The first teller answered, "Ah oh, yes, ma'am," um, because they are we are required to suspend it. The other one said, "No, but if you have funds, it can be auto debited because it's just a program." Well. Since I was able to study the circular, um, I, I talked to the tellers. <laughs> Unfortunately, I talked to the tellers and told them that they are, in a way, they are both right. 
So since the law requires that the there will be a minimum 30 day grace period, um, the, the law also allows the financial institutions to coordinate with the clients if they wish um, they will be auto-debited. In my case, I would have wanted to have my account auto-debited. Unfortunately, my bank is at the DIA while I'm here in Lipa, so I so it's very difficult for me to coordinate with them. But if, as mentioned in here in this slide, the financial institutions um, should coordinate also with their clients. If they wish to reverse the check cleared or payment debited prior to the enactment of the the Bayanihan Act. So this one, if for example, um, before the Bayanihan Act was implemented, and if you were already deducted, for example, March 15, my auto debit is on March 15. Should I wish that um, that amount debited will be credited back to my account? I will just call my bank and tell them, oh, can you please put them back? Um, they will, uh, according to the law, um, um, by coordinating, we could. The reversal shall be done without corresponding fee and charges. Okay. So now the next question will be, when will this grace period commence? Will it be from the payment due date or from the end of it, the ECQ? The 30-day grace period shall commence from the payment due date falling within the ECQ period. So in my case, my auto debit is scheduled every 15th of the month. So it will be 30 days. Um, so on May 14, that will be, um, that's the time when, um, that will be the end of my grace period on April 14, okay? Now, let's proceed. Will the principal amount payable during the grace period be added to the principal amount due in the next payment due date? Or will the final due date of the entire loan be moved by 30 days? So this is very interesting, okay? The last, for example, the last payment due date will be moved by 30 days. Interest accrued during the 30-day mandatory grace period may be paid first in lump sum um, on the new date or on staggered basis over the remaining term of the loan. So we'll give you an example. Now, let's proceed to the next slide for the example there. So, for example, it's a five-year loan with a maturity life remaining of four years. If the monthly amortization of the loan is due on April 2, 2020, to 10500 with a portion applied to payment of the principal, for example, the principal is 10000 and the monthly interest is 500 what will be the new date? Um, applying the 30-day grace period. So, so in April 2, what will be the new date for the new for the the new the new due date? It will be on May 2nd, 2020. Now, so this is the interesting part. How much will the borrower pay on the next due date? So, as I mentioned earlier, you can either pay them lump sum. The interest can be paid on lump sum on the next due date, or you can pay it on a staggered basis. So the computation, the first computation, 10,000, that will be the principal, plus 500. So it will be, that's the interest due on during the ECQ period, and another 500, which is, which is the, um, the new interest due on, on the new due date. So the total amount that will be paid is 11,000. So for so. That's the first one, if you would want it lump sum. On a staggered, and how will we present if it, the interest will be paid on a staggered basis? So this is the computation. The principal for one month, plus interest for one month, plus interest for one month or four years times 12 months. So the computation will be 10,000. That's the principal. And the 500, uh, is, this is the interest or the next due date and the uh, 500 um, times 4, um, um, the 4 12 of that because it will be applied on a staggered basis. So the total amount that you will pay will be 10,510 pesos and 42 centavos. This is assuring that the principal and interest are constant at 10,000 and 500 respectively. So this will move the due date 
of the last payment by 30 days. For example, if the last payment due date again is on May 20, April 2024, before the application of the 30 day grace period, the new due date will now be May 2, 2024. Okay. Another frequently asked question How will the IRR provisions apply to loans other than those on rate monthly? So the answer under the, the law. The 30-day grace period will apply to all loans, regardless of its amortization schedule, as long as the due date falls within the ECQ. So the financial institutions will just simply add 30 days to the due date falling within the ECQ to determine the new due date. Okay. So, so these are notes, uh, the important notes to remember. Covered institutions are also prohibited from requiring the clients to waive the application of the provisions of the Bayanihan Act, including the mandatory grace period. In addition, no documentary stamp tax must be imposed on credit extensions and credit restructuring, micro lending, including those obtained from pawn shops and extensions thereof during the ECQ period. So it's the waiver that is prohibited. Uh, but as mentioned earlier, if you would like to coordinate with your financial institution that you want to weigh this, then you're not in violation. So, so what would be the penalty? So failure to comply with the provisions of the IIR after its effectivity date may result in the opposition of fine ranging from 10,000 to 1,000 and or two, mo two months imprisonment when on responsible individual. So, um, that ends my talk for banking institutions. So let me return you to Bianca for our question and answer. Thank you, Attorney Bante, for your informative discussion about the issuances of the government agencies you mentioned. Now we will proceed in answering the questions of our clients and attendees. In this question and answer portion, we will now ask Attorney Nikki Andrade and Attorney Christian Ardincola to accompany Attorney Evita Abante in answering the questions. We will also be asking questions which were not answered earlier. So number one, uh, this is regarding the recruitment industry. What will happen to special work permits that have already expired? Do they leave the Philippines? Um, can I answer? Yes, I can I answer? Abante, yes. Okay. Okay, I'll answer. Um, I also work um, working uh, for the immigration uh, uh, immigration transactions of the firm. For SWP, the immigration, the Bureau of Immigration also extended the application for SWPs and the renewal thereof. So um, they're not required to leave the country. Um, they're, they're, so it basically it is extended also. Thank you, Attorney Abante. We will now proceed to the next question. This is actually a clarificatory question um, regarding BTI issue ones. His question is, is this a waiver? Is this waiver of rent limited to commercial establishments? Uh, if you look at the BTI issue ones, it refers actually to MSMEs or micro, small, and medium enterprises. Now, for commercial, um, for retail establishments, um, I think there is a confusion, but um, the waiver of rent to mall tenants is different from the differ the 30 degrees period for residential and MSMEs. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. We will now proceed to the third question. Attorneys, is there an exception for companies linked to the manufacturing of food and other necessities to operate as well? For example, Manufacturers of packaging supplies, supplies for maintenance of food, manufacturing equipment, and the likes. Thank you. This was uh, clarified also by DTI, where it uh, provided that the suppliers, such as um, manufacturers of packaging materials for food manufacturers, are also included in the exempted ex enterprises. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. We have a follow-up question from Ms. Ching Chua. Do customers need to show they have suffered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic to ask for the grace period? Uh, for the 
uh, the customers don't need to show that they suffered during the grace period. Uh, it's an automatic uh, relief that has been that was provided. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. We have actually last two questions for this Q and A portion before and before we end this webinar. So the second to the last question is. If a non-operational retail establishment is not located inside a mall, shall rent still be waived? If the commercial establishment is not inside a mall, um, you would have to, the rule that would apply would be the 30-day grace period. The waiver of rent um, specifically applies only to uh, mall tenants and those um, who provide entertainment um, such as nightclubs, bars, and taverns, and pubs. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. So we will now ask the last question. If alcohol is locally produced, how and we apply for tax exemptions? For the alcohol, if the manufacturer imports um, raw materials from, if, if the manufacturer imports raw materials to produce alcohol in the Philippines, then um, the manufacturer may apply for tax exemption because the raw materials as well as the alcohol imported are exempt from duties and um, taxes such as VAT, excise taxes, and other fees that I mentioned. However, the circular as well as the BI, BIR and the Bureau of Customs circular doesn't provide if the alcohol raw materials are being produced here in the Philippines, there are no exemption being uh, provided in the circular. But if the raw materials again are imported outside the Philippines, imported or the alcohol itself is being imported, then the manufacturer may apply for the exemption before the BOC and the BIR. Thank you, Attorney Advincula. We observe that we have several follow-up questions and we will entertain them. One question is from Ms. Annalisa Sisrakon and this question is directed to Attorney Abante. Clarifications only, sir or ma'am, regarding reversals. Our customer issued us checks and it was bounced or it bounced during the enhanced community quarantine. What will he do or uh, what will he or she do regarding this matter? Who is responsible to request for the reversals or fees? Um, hi, Miss Lisa. So Miss Lisa is actually um, one of my clients. So I hope you're healthy and well today. So as regards her question, the one responsible to request for a reversal should be the customer and not, uh, not you, ma'am. And who will be responsible for the fees, if ever there's any, should be your customer for. Thank you, Attorney Abante. This is a question from Gloria Loza. Our stores are located at Naia. What rule will apply? I think she is asking on the rentals. Can they be given six months grace period? For uh, no, for the uh, operation of the uh, the closure of the establishment in the airport operations, um, this would be considered um, under the thirty day grace period. Thank you, Attorney Andrade. We have one last question for this webinar. For instance, if original payment due date falls on March twenty, then the thirty day mandatory extension date is. April 20. Given April 20 is also within the ECQ or Enhanced Community Quarantine period, do we need to extend again to May 20? This is for loan and financial lease contracts. Yes, um, I would like to answer it. Thank you, Bianca. Yes, it will be extended. Um, if um, Under the circle also, if it involves already two months, it can be um, amortized for six months. The, the payment will be amortized for six months, so it will be extended. 
Thank you, Attorney Abante. Um, we would like to apologize, but due to time constraints, we will have to wrap up this today's webinar. However, if you have further questions, you may want to uh, contact or communicate with the moderators or the speakers of this webinar. I will give the floor to uh, to Ms. Nostratis or Ms. Jelena Nostratis to uh, inform you of their contact details. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you learned something today. And for other concerns or follow-up questions, or if you realize that you may need something to process something, you may contact us. For attorney Evita Abante, her email address is evita.abante at gsmhlaw.com. For attorney Tanya L. Andrade, tanya.andrade at gsmhlaw.com. And for attorney Christian L. Advincula, christian.advincula at gsmhlaw.com. So again, I would just like to inform you that this is a two-part webinar. And for our second part, which will be held on April 23, Thursday at 2 p.m., we will discuss repertorial requirements for SEC, BIR, and other implementing agencies. We will also discuss with you suggestions for post-ECQ recoveries for businesses and other enterprises. So as you can see in your screen, these are the topics to be, to be discussed on Thursday. One of our associates, a certified public accountant, will also join us and discuss the, reg the regulations and issuances of BIR with regards to tax concerns. All right, so that ends our webinar for today. Please do email us if you have further concerns and we hope to see you again on Thursday. Thank you.